spiritual teacher, writer, and priest that some of you know, um, have, have probably read, read some of his works, Henry Nouwen. He once wrote that we all find ourselves bouncing around three very human lies. Three very human lies that we tell ourselves and that cause us no end of trouble. These lies are, I am what I have, I am what I do, and I am what others say and think about me. I am what I have. What I have maybe is a large family or I have a good job. I might have a lovely home in a safe neighborhood. I might have the various accoutrements that make life easy and comfortable. And this is me. I am what I do. What I do is work a good job or I'm a competent professional. What I do is I give to charity and so I am generous. Or I am basically a nice guy and a decent father. I am what I do and this is me. I am what others think about me and others think of me as accomplished or trustworthy or intelligent or a good Christian or hardworking and this is me. I am what I have, I am what I do, I am what others say or think about me. And these are the lies we tell. We spend the whole first half of our life, of our lives building up these things and, and making a life for ourselves, which is necessary and sensible. But what almost every spiritual path from the great world religions, and ours is no different, tells us in one form or another is that the over-identification of ourselves with what we do and what we have and what others say about us is the surest and greatest obstacle to the development of our deeper and truer selves. To say I am what I have or do or what others say about me and to pursue those things as an end in themselves is to deceive oneself. The writer and monk Thomas Merton referred to what we build as the false self. The famous cultural anthropologist Ernest Becker calls it the vital lie. Buddhists call it the impermanent self. And in Christian theology, it's one way of understanding what is meant by our original sin, that we all have this inherent devotion or addiction or tendency to the propping up of our small, false selves when we are truly something much greater and more vast, made for much broader horizons. We are... The Franciscan writer Richard Rohr names it a unique aspect of the infinite mystery of God. So much more than what we have or what we do or what others say about us. So much more. So you remember that when we began Lent, many weeks ago. We began it on um, Ash Wednesday, February 14th. Um, and this, that first Sunday, we had the scripture, where we, which we always do, where Jesus is tempted by the devil in the wilderness. And Jesus is, is very much coming to terms as he enters into his public ministry with these very human lies. Remember in the Gospel of John now that, that Jesus refers to the devil as what? The father of lies. And these three lies, we can assume, are some of the devil's favorite children. 
I am what I do. Here, Jesus, turn these stones into bread. Show us what you can do. I am what I have. Worship me, the devil says, and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. I am what others say about me. If you are the son of God, as people say, then throw yourself down from the pinnacle and you will not be hurt. Then his temptations ended with that ominous phrase, and then the devil left him until an opportune time. And sure enough, the opportune time comes on Palm Sunday as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Everyone is so excited about Jesus' coming, and everyone is talking about his miracles and his teachings, the way he bested the most scholarly rabbis, the way he's gathered huge crowds of people and inspired and energized them, and who knows what he's going to do next. He is a superstar, this Jesus Christ. He is what he's been doing, and everyone is talking about it. That is until he comes into Jerusalem on a donkey, and turns the money tables over in the temples, and you don't mess with people's money, and doesn't defend himself against the accusations, but goes as a lamb to the slaughter to be executed as a criminal without igniting any kind of revolution. What? Then it's no longer, hooray, Jesus is the best but it's crucify that guy, crucify him. And and that's the fickle nature of our false, small selves. When we lose our job that we we are over-identified with, or we make a terrible mistake, and the nice guy image that we believed was who we were crumbles to the ground, or our children have serious problems and those around us say bad things about our parenting, then we suddenly become painfully aware just how flimsy and problematic the lies are that we tell. If Jesus was determined, like all of us are, by what he did, or what he had, or what others said about him, he never would have entered Jerusalem. Within just a few days, he will stand before Pilate and respond to Pilate's question about whether he is a king by saying, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. And Pilate will say in all of his power and control before he scoffs and walks away from him, what is truth? Spoken out of the false self. Spoken by the son of the father of lies to the son of God. What is truth anyway? And that reverberates, does it not, down through the ages, the man in power, the people in charge saying, what is truth? You have your truth, I have my truth. You have your facts, I have my facts. And the father of lies licks his chops and eats it up. So, Just picture it for a moment. Even if it's in your mind's eye a stereotypical image from movies you've seen or paintings, picture just for a moment Jesus standing before Pilate. Jesus maybe in simple robes and sandals. An image of the true self. an image of the true self, standing in great halls of Roman power before Pilate in his royal garb and on his high throne, 
an image of the false self. The Son of God standing vulnerable and true before the Son of the Father of lies. I am what I have. Jesus standing there before Pilate has nothing. No home. No possessions. No friends. I am what I do. Jesus standing there does nothing. He barely defends himself. He offers no miracle that he could offer. He's contributing nothing to, to Roman society, but accused of being a rabble rouser and a criminal. I am what others think about me. And Jesus, by the time he's standing there in front of Pilate, has no one thinking much of anything about him by this time other than he's an embarrassment, he's a loser, he's a fraud, he's a fool. And yet we know not just from how the story is written, but in, the, in, our, in our heart of hearts, we know the truth of that simple man, that simple presence of Christ. And that the propped up, power-filled, greatly feared human king of Pilate is in that equation one to be pitied. And so that's the scene I invite you into to take with you into Holy Week. It's, it's a snapshot of your own soul. Of my own soul. That's, that, that's the power of these stories and what we are engaging. Snapshots of our own soul. Right there within you, you have your false self. Your own little Roman tyrant. Your own little pilot. Who holds out to sustain the vital lie that you are only what you do and you are only what you have and that you are only what people are saying about you. But praise the Lord because you also have within you much deeper and more enduring, stronger and waiting to emerge. You have Christ in you. Your true self that has never been determined by what you have and what you do and what others say about you. So in fact, hooray and hosanna for those times when there is a collapsing of your false self for the lost job or the embarrassing mistake or the humiliating experience. Bring it on, though the ego says no. The sooner we come to understand and doubt that such things are really who we are, the better. For really, what we are, what you are, is a unique and beautiful aspect of the infinite mystery of God. That's who you are.